my name is Joe Ducey, I'm from Berlin um, and this story goes back to the year 2000. Um, it's where a particular detective in Berlin uh, began to carry out a vendetta against me. Uh, we'd both gone out with the same woman. Uh, she was finished with him and when I went out with her, he wasn't very happy then. Um, and life for me was to change and 15 years later still is a nightmare. Um, Whatever power this detective held over all the Gardaí in Ballina, he was able to influence them into doing whatever, uh, whether it was harassment, being stopped in a car, uh, beaten up by them, and framed on many, many charges. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll take you through this by going through the affidavit which I have in with the Minister of Justice at the minute. Uh, and I won't go into all details, there's too many incidents to go into, so I, I'll just go for the main ones where my case was proven against the Gardaí and the state. It goes back to the first arrest, uh, which was the 11th of the 8th, 01. Uh, I won't mention the guard's name, by two guards in Balna. Uh, after this arrest, I was beaten in the barracks. Um, I remember being held back against a wall by three or four Gardaí, and um, two Gardaí, I know one was a sergeant because of the stripes on his sleeve, uh, and wearing black, black gloves, they actually tried to strangle me. But the member in charge that night, uh, who was holding me back, when he realised what was going on, stopped it, said not on his shift, and I was released uh, and sent home in a taxi a few minutes after. Um, this, uh, this arrest was featured in a, a future court case. Something else happened that night, which I'll tell you at a later stage. Um, it then became commonplace that I was arrested. I was arrested again on the 6th of October 01 and the 30th of October 01. Um, basically without reason, it was for harassment and intimidation purposes. I was to realise at a later stage that the reason for all these arrests were that when in custody, um, I was signing documents uh, for uh, your property back or whatever. And little did I know that these signatures were going to end up on signed confessions in the Garda barracks, which was to come up at a later stage. Um, at this stage in uh, 2001, every Garda in Balna seemed to know who I was, uh, what car I was driving. I was stopped untold times on, on the road. I was threatened, I was told to get out of town. And it, it, it was always, um, I know it was this detective that was behind the whole thing. Um, in one particular instance, when I was arrested, uh, I collapsed in Balna Barracks with chest pains. Uh, I was in the cell. An ambulance was rang and I was brought to Castlebar Hospital. Um, a particular guard in question and another detective from Balna followed the ambulance to Castlebar and stood beside the bed while I was in hospital being examined. And the doctor literally had to tell them to go away. Um, they stayed there for about six or seven hours and then just disappeared. Uh, also at this time, it seemed that the Gardaí were intent on blackening my name around the town. Um, so the detective originally in question that was carrying out the vendetta was going into places I used to frequent, my local pub, whatever, and he was bringing uniform Gardaí in with him and asking for me by name. And people that knew me were ringing me to tell me, you know, the girls were in here looking for you. So I often rang the barracks to see why they were looking for me, and there was no answer. They said we weren't looking for you. So it was just more intimidation tactics and to, uh, you know, to lose witnesses for me. Uh, on the 4th of the 12th, 01, uh, I went to uh, a pub in Balna called Katie's Corner at the time. Um, I was with uh, a friend of mine who also owns a, a pub in Balna. Um, one of his bar staff had just opened the pub, so we said we'd call in to see how she was doing. Uh, we had one pint and walked outside, and the unmarked squad car was outside waiting for me, with this detective and three other guards. Uh, they immediately set upon me, they told the man that was with me to take a walk. Um, they began giving me a mouthful of abuse. Um, I didn't know what was going on. Before I knew what was happening, I was dragged to the ground. I was dragged to the back of the squad car and thrown in. Um, the detective in question had his 
I was face down on the back seat. He had his knee in my back and I couldn't breathe for the duration to the, the Garda barracks. Uh, I received a barrage of blows to the back of the head and when I, I was dragged out of the car and bet in the back of the head and pushed into the barracks. Um, I have a medical report for that night as to what happened to me, but the next day I was charged for assault in the Gardaí. I, cu I couldn't believe it. Um, this, this was just a marker for what was to come. Um, this went to court in January 2002. The fact that I was supposed to have uh, assaulted a guard was thrown out when he was caught lying. But the judge in question um, would not allow me to say anything. When I told uh, what the guards, I, I said to the judge what the guards are saying here is a pack of lies. I was told that I had an awful attitude. I was chastised by the judge. I wasn't allowed to say anything. Uh, and I was told to get off the stand and she did me with drunken disorderly. Um, I appealed this case um, and I employed a solicitor and barrister, a, a solicitor from who had just set up a business in Ballina, um and had a consultation with a barrister that he got um, on the, to, to go ahead with the appeal. Uh, five minutes before the appeal, uh, which was on the 2nd of the 5th, 02, they refused to defend me. They said that they had been contacted by the guards and were threatened not to go ahead with what I wanted to say. Um, the solicitor's advice then was for me to get out of town, that I wasn't safe. And this, this was uh, what the Gardaí were relating to me as well. Um, this went on then uh, also in May 2002. I was then summoned on 16 charges. 13 of these charges were abusive and threatening text messages, one of criminal damage, one of drunken disorderly and one of being abusive. This, this was a total shock. Um, the, when I got the book of evidence on this particular case, it stated that I had sent the ex-girlfriend uh, abusive and um, threatening text messages, which I hadn't. Um, in the book of evidence, what surprised me was two signed confessions appeared that I never made. Uh, I explained to you earlier on how they got the signatures. Before this went to court, I decided can't have this. I knew I hadn't made the statements, so I employed a forensic expert called Jam James Nash, um, a handwriting expert, document, uh, etc., to examine the statements. The, um, he arrived down a couple of days before the court case was actually due and he examined the uh, alleged statements and documents with a thing called a NESDA machine. This was a machine that was used in the Birmingham 6 case and it detects any indentations in documents or whatever. Uh, naturally it was my signatures, we suspected that. Um, however, he did develop a series of indentations in the statements, in two statements I had allegedly made. Um, when you're arrested and you make a statement in court, the, um, the guard uses uh, witness statement sheets, which are separate uh, and aren't connected to anything, and he takes his statement and he files it away. However, the, in the series of indentations showed that all the statements, including the witness statements, is, the statements had been written and were all on top of each other in copybook form or in A4 pad form. And the indentations travelled through uh, these two alleged statements I had made. Also, indented words from statements which weren't even in existence had travelled through these statements uh, in chron by chronological order. So it proved, and the evidence was given by James Nash, that the indentations weren't accidental and that all the statements were written out in the same copy pad at the one time. Um, this was thrown out by the judge. She wouldn't accept it. She went into cover-up mode for the Gardaí. Um, she said, I don't want to know about indentations. Uh, it's his signatures on the statement and I'm accepting these statements. Also, the state witness um, had also admitted to blackmail with the, you know, in, conjunct in collusion with the detective. And the judge jumped in and said, no, no, don't implicate yourself. Say, say no more on that. 
she, she, you see, this was the time the McBrearty case had come out, and this was the same time, and I'm sure they weren't going to let another scandal break out where statements were involved and Gerdy were corrupt, and they really went to town to cover it up. Before entering the courtroom, I seen the judge and the superintendent talking outside the courtroom, and I seen them clearly point over to me. So I, kn I knew something was going on. But that was that particular instance. That, that case was appealed to the circuit court, but um, there was many other incidents in the meantime uh, when I was around Ballina, uh, for example, on the 22nd of the 4th um, in the Loft Pub in Ballina, this detective was in a bondé and he was mad drunk and made a lunge for me. Went to attack me because he knew I was onto him and knew what was going on. Um, on the 5th of the 6th, 02, in the My Club in Belna, this detective again attacked. In this particular instance, he headbutted my brother and broke his nose. Uh, he drew kicks and belts at me. We both have medical reports to sustain this. Uh, the upshot of this was that we were both to be charged with assaulting him. And this, this uh, it just got crazy from here on. Um, there had also been another uh, attack by this detective and his brothers, who were from Galway, who were visiting one night, but uh, that was stopped. Mm. I, just, I just forgot a bit uh, on the district court uh, where the, the evidence for the indentations were given. When the guard was on the stand that claims he took the statements from me, um, and he heard about the indentations, um, he became violently uh, distraught. He, he became very pale, his hands started shaking and he lost his voice. And this is where the judge cut in to cover up for them. She, she, she knew they'd been caught. Um, in, in, in this particular instance, the judge decided that the best thing to do was to annihilate me if she could. So she said I was psychotic. And this became the newspaper headline and uh, again to destroy character now to me to say that someone's psychotic or even in an opinion is a medical opinion which i don't think that a judge is fit to give and this particular judge over the years has prejudiced herself in many many cases and indeed is uh, named in the uh, point wiping debacle on penalty points and you have to ask yourself is a judge like this fit to uh, adjudicate, I, I, I don't think so. But um, that's something I will address at a later stage and I, I will bring this judge down. Um, so that's basically the, the, the main part of uh, the district court. Um, now there was uh, another couple of arrests in the meantime. On the 25th of September in 02, um, I was arrested uh, in b just outside the door of Balna Barracks. Um, I had called by appointment to see uh, uh, a female sergeant there uh, in relation to complaints I had lodged over the attacks from this detective and my brother had lodged um, uh, statements as well. Uh, I called to the barracks at 10 o'clock at night to find out what was going on. That was when uh, her shift started and I was told to get out of the barracks. And I said, I'm just here to get an update on what's going on as regards my complaint. Uh, at that, I was pushed to the door by three uh, Bongardi and told to get out of the barracks. And I was left standing outside the door in Wall Street in Belna. I thought, what was that all about? The next thing, the door opened and they came out and said I was under arrest, put handcuffs on, and I was locked up for the night. And I was, the next morning when I was released, I was charged with drunken disorderly and refusing to leave a barracks. Typical. Um, again, I was done on the drunken disorderly on this. I came up in front of the same judge again and again could not present any evidence or testimony in court. When the appeal of the 16 charges came before the circuit, circuit court, uh, this happened on the 6th of the 11th, 2002. A judge came in and what we now believe to be what happened was that he didn't want to be involved in the case and he immediately prejudiced himself and he guaranteed the state that he would give me a prison sentence or keep the prison sentence that I was given in the district court uh, without hearing any evidence. Uh, the case had to be stopped immediately um, <coughs> and the judge removed himself from the case. Now also the state witness, the ex-girlfriend, when on the stand was caught being coached by the detective by my barrister and solicitor 
and he was warned outside the court of what he was doing and a row broke out they actually physically went fighting outside the court Who? the solicitor and the detective and they all walked away in a huff but it was seen what was going on the state witness was being coached by every member of the Gardaí and admitted to having spoke to every member of the Gardaí in Balna. Before the circuit court appeal on the 16 charges, uh, James, N James Nash was re-employed to come down and test any documents he could find in the book of evidence, witness statements, everything. Um, on his previous examination of the documents he found half words, letters that he wanted to match in and whatever. So we wrote to Balna Barracks and asked could we go in and test all these documents. We were told by uh, Balna that we could, but first of all they wanted to send the documents to Phoenix Park HQ so they could test the documents for their own, um, to, de to debate anything that was going to go on in court. So we said that was fine. So it turned out that on the 14th of the 1st, 03, James Nash went back in to test the documents. When he went in, the Gardaí refused to give him any documents except the ones he'd already tested. But the guard who had summoned me and was prosecuting these charges was the man that met him in the barracks. And when he went in to check the statements, he was sitting there with a pen in his hand and said, Oh dear, I forgot myself and overwrote the indented word. Or one particular indented word. And James Nash said, why would you do that? So he says, I, I don't want to know, he said. So he re-examined the documents and found out that the indentations were gone completely off every document. And he thought, this is very strange. But they wouldn't let him test the documents, that w other documents we wanted, so he left. Now when he came out, James Nash said to me, he says, he says, this guard, he said, he, he's overwritten one of the indented words. He says, you know why? And I said, no. He said he's given his superiors a reason for the in, one of the indentations. But he said he's messed it up because he forgot about all the other indented words. So he said he even gave me the pen to say that he did it. He said he doodled, he forgot himself. Very, very strange. But he said what's even more strange is all the indentations have gone. And he said the only way that could happen is that the documents would have to be soaked in uh, water and dampened and rolled or ironed with a heavy implement. He gave this exact same evidence in court in the circuit court appeal and the judge said so what? Now this judge um, was to become the first GSOC commissioner and to me this spelt corruption big style. Now, another thing I forgot to tell you was that these signed confessions were the only um, evidence that the state provided in anything. There was no phone records, there was no uh, evidence of any text messages. In fact, the guard that prosecuted um, in, his, in his statement in the book of evidence, he states that he told the witness to delete the messages and just write, down, write them down on a piece of paper. And this is what they used as evidence against me. And that's up on the internet under uh, on, on the Irish Independent. It, it was a shocking. Absolutely no evidence. All um, testimony. We, we proved in court that the text messages couldn't have been sent because there was too many characters in the text messages for phones of that, of that time period. Um, we cut the guards outlying, we cut the state witness outlying, she cracked, she was summed up at the end of the uh, court case as a profound liar whose evidence should not be taken. Um, the judge in question in the circuit court obviously knew I was set up. He stared the guards out at it, he suspended all sentences, he extracted the urine out of them in his last comment when he said, how could we teach Mr. Ducey not to break the law again? Should he break it again, we will fine him 20 euros. And that was the end of the case. But I still remain convicted. Uh, this was appealed uh, on a judicial review to the High Court. Um, I employed a uh, uh, senior counsel. Um, I became wary of the solicitor I had at this stage. 
um, and felt that he wasn't working in my best interests. And when the High Court case came up, uh, the conviction was not overturned. And I felt that there was a certain amount of misleading going on between solicitor and barrister. Uh, the barrister wouldn't talk to me um, after the case. And funny enough, the solicitor who represented me in that case, uh, who was still a practising solicitor, despite having been fined uh, 100000 by the Law Society for stealing money out of people's accounts, uh, he was also done on representing both sides of a case and being done on a conflict of interest, and he's, he's still a practising solicitor. So I, I, I've no doubt that he did work with the against me and that he worked with the opposition. you think at this stage there was enough done but um, just one, one final thing on that um, circuit court appeal. Nearly every guard in Balna turned up at the case to intimidate me, my family, and, and, and solicitors and everything. But um, again, the High Court was futile. At this stage, I was probably out of pocket to the tune of maybe up on 100,000. So... I, I, I seen that there was no point in, in going any further. Um, I totally lost confidence in the country and I left. I went working in, in England. Uh, I was actually driving a machine on Terminal 5 in Heathrow. Um, I was only there a couple of months and my father rang me and he said that uh, a letter had arrived in the post that I had been banned off the road. Um, I think there was four charges in it for speeding, failure to produce insurance and uh, uh, NCT. And I was out of the country. So I knew absolutely nothing about this. So I rang my solicitor and appealed the case and I came back from London to see what was going on here. Uh, I had all the documentation on the car about, uh, you know, for uh, driver's license, everything. Went to court and produced everything. And all the charges were thrown out except the speeding fine. And on the the summons for the speed and fine, it said, doing in excess of the speed limit. And I said, I wasn't even pulled, I knew nothing about this, but yet I was still done. And I, it's just ridiculous. There was no, um, anything goes in courtrooms in Ireland. Shortly after that, uh, I went to the house and uh, Gerdy began arriving at the house. Um, they arrived to take possession of my driving license even though the charges had been thrown out they said that there was a court order that you'd lost your license and they wanted it. I know now that it that that is not one of their functions that Gerdy are not allowed to take your license. But this was just a case of let's keep the intimidation going. Um this kept going on. Uh then there was an, another strange arrest on St Stephen's Day in two thousand and three. Boxing Day, day for backing horses. I went into Belna to put a bed on. Uh, pulled up outside the Buckies. Um, was I think I was on the phone. I sat in the car for a few minutes, and I looked down the street and seen a squad car coming up the wrong way with guards walking each side on the path. And when I looked the other way, there's a set of traffic lights, and that had been blocked off by a squad car. And I thought this couldn't be for me. And with that, the uh, pounded on, the jumped on the car, opened the door, and dragged me out. I'd say I looked like the biggest drug dealer of all times, being dragged out of the car in the middle of the street and banged into a squad car and away. I had been arrested on failure to put in a tax return form by revenue. This resulted in a special sitting of the court since Stevens's night in Roscommon Town, which was 60 odd miles away. Uh, a full court had to be called out. Uh, it took three Gardaí to drive me to Roscommon Town. Um, the judge came in, the look of disgust on his face was laughable. He said, uh, right, 100 euros bail out. Hear it again in January, whatever. I walked back outside, I was getting into the squad car and I was told to F off by the guards, find me on my home. Now they had me money, all me stuff in the barracks. Lucky enough, I just managed to stop the solicitor on the road and he had to bring me back home. Uh, I had to send me further to get in to get me stuff back out of the barracks. Uh, he was away in England at the sisters for Christmas. He collected it when he came back. I wouldn't go to the barracks for fear of being arrested again for something. Uh, again, I was brought up in front of the same judge on this revenue charge. Said I knew nothing about it. Uh, again, she denied me any uh, 
speech in court. But the funny thing was, she really lost the rag with the guards in this case. She said, she asked the superintendent who put in a maximum fine of 1800 uh, it probably punts at the time and the superintendent just held his hands up and she said who arrested this man on Stevens's day and he meant he said the guards and she says bring these guards to my chamber immediately he stated that they were off for the day and she said I don't care I want them in my chambers now um, I was fined 450 euros again got no chance to defend myself and that was the case over um, so that was basically it. I stayed away from Belna for a long time after this. Um, I had uh, appealed the High Court to the Supreme Court, but I, I didn't have the money to go ahead. I needed 50000 up front before I could go ahead, uh, according to the solicitor or the legal team. So I stayed away for a few years. I went back to England, whatever. I was working up around Dublin. Um, I basically stayed away from Belna. Um, I was frightened of what they might do to my father at home. Uh, I, I, I was in fear myself because I knew these people could plan something on me. They could make it a lot worse. But um, <coughs> in 2009, this is just another incident, I, I, I came down one weekend with my partner Anne to visit my father. Um, while we were down, uh, we were working so we didn't have much time, so we went in to get tyres on her car, so I said follow me in. As I passed the barracks, I seen uh, another detective who would have recognised me, and I seen him change direction as soon as he seen me, and followed me. Um, it's kind of a twisty road to the tyre place, but he, he followed, I knew he was behind us. Um, he pulled up, and when we got out of the car, I said to him, we're after being followed by detective, I won't mention his name, I says get your camera out and video him. He didn't realise that she was with me so when she got the camera and started walking towards his car he put his hand over his face and drove off rapidly. Uh, I said Tan watch this now in five minutes there'll be a squad car down to find out who you are. It took seven minutes and I seen them writing the number of her car down obviously to find out who she was. In 2010 it still didn't end. I left Ballina one weekend, um, going through Foxford from Ballina on the way up to Dublin. I let um, a, a squad car out in front of me. Uh, well, I didn't realise it was a squad car until it actually pulled out. It was um, the unmarked squad car, and it was a detective from Ballina driving it. So he started playing cat and mouse with me. Every few miles he'd pull in, I'd pass him, and then he'd pass me. I, I thought it was just intimidation. But when we got outside Swinford, he stopped me on the road. He didn't stop me. He pulled into the hard shoulder and I passed him. And then he came after me and said that I'd overtaken on a solid white line. Um, this went to court and I actually won this in court. I got a, a solicitor who was uh, not scared of Gardy and destroyed him. This guard was just caught telling lies. And even it was the same judge again, believe it or not. I could see that she had now learnt that I she had now could now see that I wasn't frightened to speak either and she was becoming worried. In 2011 I set up a business in Kildare and uh, I'm still staying away from Belna. Within a couple of days of setting up the business uh, I had hired out an industrial unit and was moving into the unit and straight away the sheriff arrived. He told me that there was an outstanding debt on the unit for unpaid rates and that because I was the new tenant I was liable for the last year, two years rates. It was a law that was in existence until recently. Um, I said that's fine I'll move out again. Um, and it took some fighting. They, they, they really wanted to go to town on me as if they were under instruction. Uh, the business I set up was a wholesale confectionery. Um, within a week then HSE arrived at the the, the door uh, threatening to close me down and why I hadn't informed him what I was doing I said I haven't even opened yet um, then I received uh, an unofficial visit from Revenue uh, and then I got phone calls from Revenue and they stated that I was uh, a Phoenix company and all this and that I had left uh, had a business in confectionery which I'd left massive debts behind uh, which was totally untrue and I was able to prove I was able to prove what I had done for many years. However, revenue wouldn't back down. Um, and there were some heated arguments with revenue over this. And the next thing, the Gardaí were involved again. 
uh, certain people in revenue said that I had threatened them. I had heated, heated debates with them, all right, but I hadn't threatened them. But I was warned off, and when I wanted to make uh, threat or when I wanted to make um, statements against these people in revenue, Gerdy refused to take a statement off me. Um, and this has basically been it for the years. It's all been all one-way traffic. Um, Revenue told me that they were going to close me down, and every time a return was due, a massive estimate was done, and the sheriff was out within a week. And this happened on over 20 occasions. In the end, I just gave up. There was just no point. I wasn't going to be allowed to work in the country. I actually have a letter from Revenue where it states that they are going to make an example of me. Um, in another statement, they state that I owned a business which I didn't, uh, and which I left these significant debts behind uh, and that I was going to be monitored for the rest of my life no matter what I do and that's in black and white from revenue. Um, just to say that over the years I've witnessed large-scale corruption uh, amongst guards, solicitors, barristers, judges and indeed with government itself I've, I've seen many TDs and explained the story and, and never got any satisfaction. Um, the only people that seem to be helping us today is some of the left-wing TDs and hopefully they'll, they'll stick with it. Uh, if the state in Ireland picks on you, basically you're in serious trouble. And the story of David and Goliath is, is always in my head um, because it's, it's, it's impossible to beat them with such a tight knit. I, d I don't know what keeps them together. Um, I, don't, I, I, I personally couldn't go out and do someone wrong, so when these people do it, I, I can't understand it. Um, I've decided to stay in Balna. I'm going to be fearless with them from now on. And I, 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 years ago, they intimidated me and frightened me that much that I did run. But no more. I am standing my ground and I'm going to live where I want to live. And it's up to everyone in this country to unite against what's going on. We all know what's going on. And thanks to this social media, people now can get their story. So don't be frightened to come out and tell your story. And we must unite to stop this. Um, and that's that's really all I have to say. And thanks for listening to my story. And um, let's pray that we can turn this system around before it goes too far. Thanks. Mm -hmm.